to today's um, to today's lecture. It's the twelfth lecture uh, within the cycle of um, of you know lectures planned for uh, the contribution of vernaculars to the rise of uh, new cultural participation in Europe and Asia. Today we will listen to uh, Professor Wang uh, Xiang. Uh, that uh, intervene on the shape of the cosmopolis, Korea and East Asia in late imperial Chinese vernacular. Um, professor Wang is an assistant professor of Asian languages and cultures at UCLA. He is a historian of Choson Korea and early modern East Asia. His forthcoming book, Boundless Winds of Empire, uh, rhetoric and ritual in early Choson diplomacy with Ming China reconstructs the cultural strategy of Korean diplomacy with Ming Empire in the 15th and 16th centuries. It underscores how Korean ritual and literary practices inserted Choson into the Ming's uh, into the Ming Empire's legitimating strategies and established Korea as a stakeholder in a shared imperial tradition. He teaches courses on Korea's pre 19th century history and the history of cultural and intellectual interactions in early modern East Asia. Uh, today's lecture is uh, um, uh, once again, I say the title, the, I repeat the title, The Shape of the Cosmopolis, Korea and East Asia in Late Imperial Chinese Vernacular Literary Imagination. The coherence of East Asia in the early modern period, uh, let's say 1500 to 1800, so 16th to uh, 19th century, uh, century, relies on the intersection of three distinct imaginaries, imperial, ecumenical, and cosmopolitan, projections of universal empire through networks of tribute and trade connected imperial China with Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. These connections, however, were formed across contested ecumenical boundaries, where notions of what constituted civilization and barbarity created uh, divergent regimes of inclusion and exclusion. For states on the imperial periphery, such as Choson, Korea, Securing inclusion in a civilized order depended on cultivating practices of literary and textual exchange. Envoy, poetry, popular fiction, and epistles in literary Chinese helped build what scholars have called a Sinoscript cosmopolis, a shared culture of text that promised to transcend political division and overcome ecumenical exclusion. While Choson Korean elites largely espoused the above views, considering themselves bona fide members of broader imperial, ecumenical and cosmopolitan Im imaginaries, to what degree did the imperial Chinese counterparts view them in the same manner? Previous scholarship has endeavored uh, to answer this question by understanding Korea's place in high imperial ideology. On the other hand, the portrayal of Korea in late imperial Chinese vernacular fiction offers a different opportunity of approach. Although mentions of Korea are few and far between, scattered across a variety of genres, uh, ranging from smattering of Pai Hua novels to short anecdotal stories and the occasional appearance in a performance script, Korea's appearance in this vernacular register nonetheless illustrates how these three imaginaries, imperial, ecumenical, and cosmopolitan, interface with one another in ways that are difficult to ascertain in authoritative historical and state-centered sources. These imaginaries hardly envisioning coterminous or coextensive uh, co phenomena articulate multiple vernacular theories of 
how the East Asian cultural political universe operated. Professor Wang, uh, this sounds quite uh, interesting. So I, I give you immediately the floor uh, and really welcome into this cycle of uh, special lectures and welcome to Kafoskari, even though only virtually for the moment. <laughs> you, the floor uh, is yours. Thank all right, you. thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for, for coming. And, and I would like to show my gratitude to uh, Professor uh, Dorso for inviting me and also uh, Alice Palmieri for uh, helping arrange the logistics of uh, today's talk. The, so uh, as we mentioned already, uh, the, the title of the presentation is The Shape of the Cosmopolis, Korea and East Asia in Late Imperial Chinese Vernacular Literary Imagination. I, uh, I, I, I Hearing the abstract again, I uh, worry that I might under deliver, although I think I will talk about most of the things that the abstract mentions. Um, I think uh, uh, I'm glad that we have enough time for a question and answer. So in case there's anything I don't really have a, a get to, uh, to the detail that you would um, have expected, uh, we would have time to uh, hopefully discuss that after. Um, so let's begin. So one of the, everybody sees the slide okay, right? I hope. Okay, so before, uh, so one of the most common ways uh, pre-modern East Asia has been described is in terms of the so-called sinographic cosmopolis. Uh, the general view of this cosmopolis is that it is rooted in the common use of Chinese characters as the basis of interregional and elite communication, uh, let's say between the seventh century and the early 20th century. Much like the role of Latin in Western Europe, the Chinese script provided the anchor for a range of important structures and phenomena. Uh, I've listed a few on the slides, but I think uh, we can also add to this, uh, not just the Confucian tradition, but the wider philosophical and literary tradition, including uh, things like Tang poetry, uh, religion, not uh, including Taoism, uh, statecraft, uh, the ritual system, what I mean by Tang administration, uh, but also the medical, astronomical, and mathematical canons of East Asian knowledge, as well as the language of diplomacy, the use of the Chinese script for official communications, including um, envoy poetry. So behind this is we have uh, to, to get to this level of phenomenon. The, the research is uh, primarily uh, on um, elite phenomena, um, and this is what has driven the directions of this um, study. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Latin, uh, which I assume uh, many of you in the audience are, uh, you'll know, it, it realize immediately that there is a fundamental and critical difference between how literary Chinese or classical Chinese is used in East Asia versus Latin. And that's how in the Sinographic Cosmopolis, the emphasis is on uh, writing alone. And there's very little assumption among uh, East Asian uh, users that uh, that their language would be the same. The script is what creates the cosmopolis, um, not the spoken language per se. Uh, and this has created a, 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 what is um, often termed the diglossic model, where the cosmopolitan is posed against the vernacular, which is often equated with the spoken language. But I will argue and contest that uh, in uh, that it's not completely appropriate to think about the vernacular simply as a local or spoken variety, but that we should also think about uh, vernacularity in general um, as a particular register of linguistic interaction that can be, for instance, um, in the local vernacular languages that we're familiar with today or a vernacular scripts such as the Korean script, the Vietnamese Nome script or, or, or Japanese Kana. Um, but I think more importantly, vernacular, uh, as the word evokes, also points to um, a sort of social range uh, of texts and discourses and interactions that are occurring beneath, uh, if I may use the term, uh, the, the, the elite uh, channels of, of literary and cultural interaction. So some of these issues I've explored in my prior research, uh, for example, the role of spoken language in everyday diplomacy, 
and uh, in diplomatic interaction, uh, official interpreters uh, uh, facilitate elite interaction uh, with uh, their spoken language. But there are also other phenomena that I think of are uh, closely tied to constructing the cosmopolis, but are existing on the vernacular register. For example, when when someone in East Asia uh, is shipwrecked, uh, lost at sea, and finds himself in a different part of the world, we uh, of this world, uh, we also notice the in the use of a spoken vernacular as a regional maritime lingua franca, in particular Min or Hokkien Chinese, uh, and in some cases uh, Japanese. Uh, intriguingly, we also see the appearance occasionally of curiously cosmopolitan figures in maritime accounts and records of shipwreck repatriation. Uh, but given the sources we have, it's actually very difficult to reconstruct how these individuals acquire the spoken languages they have mastered. My suspicion is that these point to invisible or barely visible circulations that are obstructed from view in state-centered sources. I've also in my other work looked at uh, the circulation of Chinese baihua or written vernacular texts in Korea. In the traditional diglossic model, we usually think about uh, the Korean and Chinese literary space as diglossic or oppositional, where vernacularity and localness are, are uh, assumed to overlap with everyday speech and that they, they stand at uh, opposite ends with the literary synetic high cosmopolitan classics Hanmun poetry uh, being what connects these two literary well realms. And the closer you get to oral expression, the more vernacular things get. Um, however, uh, if in my examination of a, a literary experiment uh, written by a, a Korean literati in the 18th century, uh, and, and this is a text where the, the, the language is actually very hard to describe. Uh, they uh, used uh, so-called Chinese baihua or written Chinese vernacular to carry the load of the Korean local, using it to render uh, aspects of local Korean culture, Korean language, uh, Korean lexicon, um, but coded in a vernacular Chinese uh, script convention. So it's written completely in Chinese characters, but using conventions of 14th, 15th century Chinese vernacular to capture uh, that world. Uh, I think the fact that this literary experiment took place and reflects uh, actual uh, practices in Chosun Korea uh, forces us to rethink the role of vernacular texts in sustaining what we might call the East Asian cosmopolis. So this is a bit of background. Um, and the conjecture that I am uh, proposing today is that by looking more closely at the vernacular at this register, right, a, a register not necessarily of uh, of vernacular simply as the spoken language or the uh, vernacular script in Korea, um, but a particular register of interaction, uh, we get to see the quote shape of the cosmopolis more clearly. Uh, that and this we would see more clearly than if we would look only at elite phenomena and interactions, which although are not completely uniform, do tend to exhibit a convergence in values, practices, and sensibilities. Okay. And I think. Uh, what uh, I will hopefully expose through our readings of some of these uh, Chinese vernacular texts is the embedded assumptions and points of view that might not be apparent, for example, in a diplomatic encounter. Um, and I think what they show are these different uh, registers uh, and scales and modes, modalities of interaction that, that have, are in tension with one another, uh, part of these contested imaginaries. So, uh, what, what I'll do is first I'll talk about more clearly what I mean by the shape of the cosmopolis uh, and um, and hopefully convince everyone that the cosmopolis does not look the same to uh, its different constituents. Secondly, I want to talk about how the vernacular text circulating in Korea reflect and imagine this cosmopolis. Um, I think in the interest of time, I won't get into too much about the uh, what these texts are saying, but I want to give a brief overview of uh, what the cosmopolis looks like in Korea, and, and also to show that this is not something that is uh, monolithic. Uh, and, and this gets us to the main part of today's talk, and that is what about Korea in China? Uh, what about Korea in vernacular Chinese texts? So I want to uh, look at three texts in particular. Uh, one is the Zai Shen Yuan Quan, which is a 
rough I have translated as a complete story of romance reappeared. Uh, we'll look at the water margin continued, uh, the Shui Guohou Zhuan, and as well as the Dami Yingye Zhuan, Legend of the Heroes of Great Ming, um, in which Korea appears uh, in very different ways. And then we'll talk about what that implies about the shape of the cosmopolis. Okay. So the the choice of words, right? When we say cosmopolis, uh, I think it uh, there there are actually a bunch of words that uh, I think are part of this paradigm, right? Sinosphere, sinospheric cosmopolis, cosmo sinospheric uh, cosmopolitan sinosphere. Also, East Asian Republic of Letters. Uh, so the, these class of terms, uh, what they do together is uh, is evoke a certain way of imagining East Asia, and that is one that is focused on an ideal or an idea that uh, what brings everybody together is the shared views of Chinese characters. Um, this view, of course, comes from um, the work of uh, actually not a uh, scholar of East Asia, but Sheldon Pollock, uh, or rather this term uh, in his, uh, um, well, he has written a lot about this, but uh, he describes the Sanskrit cosmopolis. Uh, and here is where, and, and although this idea also has parallels in, in the scholarly traditions in Japan and China and Korea, um, today I, I just want to maybe interrogate its appropriateness for East Asia. Uh, to think about uh, cosmopolis as a valid uh, way to render this idea. So one problem is that the sense of commonality, right, of, of what is implied by this cosmopolitanism uh, is rarely ex expressed explicitly in period sources. But I think implicit is the sense that this, uh, that the use of Chinese characters, the, the common use of uh, this cosmopolitan script evens the playing field and so on. Uh, for instance, a Chosun Korean and a Ming or Qing literati might serve two courts with drastically unequal relations in the tributary system, but when they meet with each other, they can do so as cultural and intellectual equals because they have mastered a common body of knowledge, are able to communicate through brush talks, poems, and letters. Um, and this is something that we can identify among Korean, Chinese, Japanese, and Vietnamese uh, uh, scholars in the same period. But if we think about cosmopolitan more rigorously, or if we, or in one way of thinking about it is uh, political philosopher Kwame Apia's idea of cosmopolitan, in which one of the core ideas is that those who are cosmopolitan um, are able to interact with one another, not necessarily as equals, but under the premise that they're open to free and non-coercive dialogue. Um, I think this is, of course, an aspiration in any society. Uh, it's not necessarily ever actualized completely, but it's an ideal that I think um, evokes certain liberal enlightenment values and uh, and maybe uh, have resonance in certain uh, moments in world history at different places. But the problem I have with early modern East Asia is whether this is a valid aspiration at all, whether anybody in uh, pre-modern East Asia were thinking about um, their interactions in these terms. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, any student of pre-modern East Asia knows that uh, the whole idea of dialogue without respect to status, roles, hierarchy, uh, is is going to have to make a, a strong case, right? Um, you know, of course, it's possible to set aside some of these role statuses. Uh, we can ignore gender, we can ignore rank, we can ignore class, we can ignore political affiliation in certain moments. And the cosmopolitan energy can still exist, but I think we cannot just ignore the presence of these alternate uh, uh, structures um, of hierarchy. Uh, and this is especially true when we talk about uh, Koreans, Vietnamese, and Japanese who place themselves as cultural equals to their Chinese interlocutors, but still confronted both in intellectual and social terms, the insinuation that they, like other peoples on China's imperial periphery, were excluded as barbarian. Um, and this cosmopolitan vision, at least when projected from the forbidden city, was intrinsically Sinocentric. We as present scholars may not, uh, may accept that Koreans, Japanese, and, uh, and Vietnamese are part of the Sinosphere. Uh, they're bona fide members of this civilized order. 
but the problem is these individuals did not assume that their counterparts in China thought of themselves that way. And so to make sense of this and, and to give us a way to talk about these things together is, uh, is I propose um, adding two other modes of um, thinking about the structure of East Asia. And the first one is empire, or actually cosmopolitan, and then empire, and then ecumeny. So let me begin with imperial. So imperial view of East Asia is one that focuses on the institutions and traditions of empire. And by empire, I don't necessarily mean going around and conquering and colonizing, but, but this assertion of authority of legitimate political power that passes through successive rulers centered in, uh, in China. Behind this is a vast repertoire of uh, ritual, textual apparatus, ceremonies, protocols, calendars, and, uh, and a host of technologies that sustain this theoretically, theoretically indivisible and unbreakable political continuity. The pomp and splendor of imperial ritual interpreted and documented through texts uh, become a way of asserting that, right? And here we have a painting from the 18th century uh, depicting, I think, this ideology very, very well, is that uh, the emperor represents the Axis Mundi and the barbarians, uh, foreigners from afar, come here uh, to pay tribute. And depicted in, in this entourage are, are Korean and Vietnamese authors. So at least among Sinological and Chinese circles, um, you know, empire is basically equated with what is uh, the Chinese world order, right? Um, and that, um, and, uh, and the, the problem is, you know, if we take the Korean historical experience uh, is into consideration, the problem with empire is that it assumes the centrality uh, of, of the Chinese state, right? Uh, but as historians, uh, we have to ask ourselves, you know, why should we see a Korean claim or a Khitan claim or a Vietnamese claim to be inferior or superior to an imperial Chinese one? We really don't, uh, um, you know, we, you know, uh, uh, taking the 21st century vantage point, we don't need to buy into the ideology of empire. However, we also have to recognize that this ideology of empire makes it impossible uh, for those outside of it to claim to be equal without potentially stirring up the, uh, they cannot claim the shared discourses and symbols of culture without potentially stirring up the, uh, the possibility of political competition. So the second uh, view is um, that of ecumeny. Um, and, uh, you know, I, most of my colleagues don't use this word very much. So I think I need to explain it a bit uh, is, is by ecumeny, I refer to a set of discourses that pertain to the questions of the boundaries of civilization and political imagination. Uh, the word comes from gr Greek, uh, used both in um, a classical Greek and uh, Byzantine, uh, post-Constantinian Greek, uh, to refer to the habitable human realm and the realm of the emperor, the confessional community of Christendom. So, so here we have this tension where ecumeny is everything. It's the entire known world. But it's also coterminous with the world ruled by the emperor and those who are uh, civilized within it. So is it everyone or is it not everyone? <laughs> I think it's the fundamental contradiction. And we see something similar going on in, in East Asia with the term Tianxia or all under heaven, uh, Tenka, Chana. And, uh, you know, in theory, well, everything under heaven should be the whole planet, right? But the way the term is used it often only refers to the realm of the emperor. But within this paradigm, we have this other problem is, well, what does the emperor rule? Does the emperor rule only the civilized realm in the middle? Or does the emperor, is the emperor in theory, the master of all of Tianxia, of all of the, everything we see under uh, heaven? And so I think this is actually quite a common early modern, pre-modern medieval question of what is the proper limit of empire? And depending on which emperor, which dynasty, which period you ask, they'll have different answers to this question. But I think what I want to emphasize with the term ecumeny is that this is a question. This is something that is not resolved. This is something that is in flux. Um, if we think only from a Chinese Sinocentric uh, point of view, uh, in empire, ecumeny, and the cosmopolis are basically overlapping, right? There's a very little difference between the three as they're conceived. But for those who are outside of the of the uh, of the imperial order, 
um, the question of where they belong in the ecumeny decides the, the degree to which they can participate in the cosmopolitan dialogue. Okay. So if we realize that these things are in flux, um, then I think we can use the vernacular to, uh, to capture uh, and to address uh, certain configurations of how these things are interacting that we might not otherwise be able to see in um, high imperial discourse. So for example, uh, Chosun Koreans, uh, the Chosun dynasty ruled Korea from 1392 to 1910, entertained notions of cultural identification, which were definitely cosmopolitan in the sense that their elite identity believed and depended on perceived membership in a wider intellectual and cultural community that extended beyond the confines of their political boundaries. Uh, those of the Chosun dynasty were in their own reckoning members of a civilized world whose political, uh, whose historical center was China, but now transcended the confines of Korea as a political space. Um, so for, for Koreans, um, empire, uh, cosmopol cosmopolis, and ecumeny were not the same thing, right? So uh, I think briefly, I just want to talk about Korea and the vernacular cosmopolis. Um, I think if we're familiar with Korean history at all, we know that Korean elite buy-in in the cosmopolis is very strong. Uh, this is uh, something that we see throughout uh, the Choson period, uh, even the late Koryo period. Uh, but I just want to speak briefly about how deep this goes, because the presence of this Sinographic cosmopolis and this identification is something that actually doesn't require the use of Chinese characters at all. So if we call this a Sinographic cosmopolis, how do we explain uh, registers of phenomenon where what is being how this uh, wider world is being called on is not through the script. So, Bertrand um, Walravit has uh, looked at shaman songs, and which are which are completely oral until the 20th century, and how they evoke um, this larger sinographic uh, cosmopolitan imagination, which I think uh, is engaged in this ecumenical uh, debate about uh, how does Korea belong? Does it belong? And what we see from the shaman songs is that Korea is part of this wider world, uh, but it also occupies a, a distinct ecumenical space where uh, Korea is not barbarian, but it's definitely separate from China. Um, but we also see other modes. Um, recently, Ksenia Shizova has uh, wrote uh, a book on kinship novels of early modern Korea. And what's interesting about these novels, which are, they're not written in uh, the Korean script, um, but they're vernacular in the sense that it's something that is uh, circulating uh, within uh, the family. It's not part of uh, classical uh, elite uh, discourse. Uh, the users are primarily, uh, the readers are primarily women, and, uh, and the kinds of motifs, questions, and themes are reflective of uh, the family uh, uh, ideology and situation within Korea. However, all the stories take place in China, right? And imagine China uh, used as a way to express uh, Korean ideas about family. And finally, I'll give another example. And this is where we have an engagement with uh, the, this question of empire. And the Imjinok is a fictional uh, story uh, written in uh, vernacular, uh, in the vernacular script, uh, discussing uh, the Imjin War, where as we know, the Ming dynasty came to the rescue of Shosun Korea uh, against uh, the Japanese invaders. Uh, but curiously, I think throughout the, uh, the story, the Chinese are more or less written out, uh, except for several scenes where the Chinese army, uh, the general, uh, Li Rusong, who is in Korea, is, uh, even though he's here to help uh, Chosun, uh, his presence uh, is read as a threat to uh, Korea's territorial and uh, and a spiritual uh, 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 what is it, um, spiritual integrity. And so in this, um, China appears as a threatening other, um, as a as a threatening empire. Um, and it's a way for uh, Chosun to construct uh, a sense of negative identity against the potential threat of empire. And and in the uh, Imjinok or the record of the Black Dragon Year is something that uh, I think captures uh, the sense of instability, right? Where even though on the elite level, uh, Chosun Korea is sees the Ming as uh, 
officially as uh, as his ally and later as uh, a, a target of nostalgia. Nonetheless, in the um, in the register of the vernacular, it occupies a very different position. And the picture gets even more complicated if we expand our gaze to other kinds of works that bring in uh, other aspects of the cosmopolis or other members of the cosmopolis, including um, Japan or, or Vietnam. Um, but I don't think uh, in the interest of time, I want to get to the main part of the talk because I know I'm going on a little longer than I thought I would. Uh, so I'm going to skip this and get straight to Korea in the Chinese vernacular imagination. So the question is, you know, now that we've talked a little bit about how Koreans think about Imperial China and, and the cosmopolitan imaginary, um, how does it work in Imperial China? So one way to think about this question as we look through these texts is uh, we have to imagine a fairly lettered member of Chinese society in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. Uh, but one that may probably have never had a chance to interact with a Korean or a Japanese or somebody from uh, uh, a foreigner. Uh, they probably live in a, a pretty uh, urban context. Their career paths uh, are probably literati adjacent in the sense that uh, they may know some literati, but they probably have very little chance of uh, ever getting a job in the imperial bureaucracy. So these are people who, you know, depending on your social theory, uh, you can count as elites, but they're not the kinds of elites that have a say in how Imperial China organizes its uh, intellectual or diplomatic relations with the outside. So these are people who have no uh, real uh, interface with uh, with Korea. So what do they think about Korea? What, what ideas do they have? So this is what I mean by the text in the vernacular register. Um, these are Baihua uh, or Baihua adjacent uh, uh, texts. Um, but there, and uh, the first one is, in fact, uh, has an oral, a clear oral uh, component. Uh, but I'm still describing texts. And, um, and by vernacular, I'm emphasizing a particular register of interaction, a vernacular imagination that circulated outside of the literary cosmopolis. It's not part of the great tradition. Um, so to be sure, most references to Korea in in this register in, in China uh, are scattered uh, in all sorts of places. I think actually before the uh, advent of digital media and databases, it would probably be quite difficult um, to find these references at all because they're all buried within um, larger texts and Korea might just show up for, for a few lines or uh, for a few passages or for one plot point. Um, with the exception of novels that are about uh, the the Ming War with uh, Japan in Korea, the Imjin War, basically uh, these are all uh, short anecdotes. But I think these passing references um, are actually an even stronger reflection of common assumptions uh, about Korea uh, than, let's say, works that are actually dedicated to to uh, China's relations with Korea. Um, the difficulty is that we can't really tell if we're confronting the tip of the iceberg or everything that we have, right? The scale of the circulation is beyond the scope of uh, my knowledge and my current research parameters. Um, so I, I wouldn't be able to tell you how widely these ideas are shared, but simply that these are things that do appear and are part of the larger ecosystem, if you will. So. Um, so today, I, by looking at these three novels, um, I think what I want to show are these three grand narrative arcs, um, systems of tropes, if you will, that embed the assumptions or particular assumptions and attitudes uh, that pre-modern uh, about Korea in pre-modern um, China uh, and of uh, of the empire in a regional context. Okay, so the first one. Um, is this notion of Korea as an imperial rival. And this is exhibited in the Zaijin Yuan Chindran. And the related story arcs identify Korea as a potential um, uh, uh, enemy uh, of the empire. And this is, uh, and we'll talk about how that works in, in this particular um, uh, uh, trope um, or in the trope that's used in this um, story. A second um, is best exhibited in the Shui Bu Hodran or the Water Margin Continued, uh, is a uh, ref 
uh, is, I think, uh, related to memories of the Ming Chosun alliance against Japan. And it's uh, also related to me memories of an abortive uh, uh, alliance that uh, almost occurred in the 12th century between Seoul and Koryo. Uh, and this is to treat Korea as a vector or a uh, vicarious expression of loyalty for imperial revival. And, and so we have a very different view of Korea here. And then finally, we have um, the, the legend of the heroes of the great Ming, where uh, the idea of Korea um, being a loyal vassal to the empire, uh, which is, I think, reproduced over and over in Korean diplomatic uh, entry, uh, diplomatic uh, interactions with, with Ming. Um, so it comes from somewhere. Uh, but uh, in this one, uh, where the Korean envoy appears to the Ming court to affirm the Ming's own Im imperial imagination and, and claims a universal sovereignty, we sort of have a twist. And, uh, and this involves using Korea as a foil um, in, in a um, rather unexpected way, I think. Um, and so we'll get to that. So I think, uh, let me just get through each of the texts. And this is where we have the, the, the print from the, um, uh, that was used in the poster for the talk. So uh, the, the, the illustration actually doesn't come from the, uh, the actual uh, story I'm uh, talking about, the Zai Zhenyuan, um, but one of its predecessors, the one that provides the, the basic plot. And later uh, in the 18th century, Chen Duanshan takes the, the basic storyline and expands it um, and turns it into a libretto for a, uh, a vernacular um, poem um, style called the Tansi. And the plot uh, of the story, basically, um, I'm going to give a very quick synopsis of the part of the plot that matters. I mean, these are long stories where uh, one, one of the heroes, uh, actually the protagonist of the story named Huang Fu Shaohua, who is depicted here as the young, uh, handsome hero. Uh, he is a very close friend of the crown prince of the Yuan dynasty. Um, and in the story, the king of Chosan invades China and Huang Fu Shaohua leads the imperial army to defeat the king of Chosan. Okay, if you know your East Asian history, you'll see that there's something absurd about this. Uh, one is that the Chosan dynasty was founded in 1392. The Mongol Yuan dynasty ended in 1368. Uh, maybe the author confused Chosan with Koryo, but at least historically, uh, a Korean invasion of the Mongol empire uh, wasn't going to, uh, didn't, uh, the, the, the idea of Korea being a frontier threat to, to the Mongol empire, imperial, Ch imperial China countervenes, um, you know, all the standard historical understandings of, uh, uh standard historical understandings of Sino-Korean relations of the period. Um, and I, and, um, I think, uh, you know, how, and it's very unlikely that either the Ming or the Qing courts ever saw chosen Korea as a credible threat. Right. Uh, even though we know that uh, in the 17th century, uh, one Korean king did entertain um, joining the Ming loyalists to attack the Qing dynasty. So the question is, why is Chosun uh, taken and used as the the source of the threat by the author of the Zhejiang Yuan? So uh, I'm not going to speculate about the 18th century imagination. Um, I think for Chen Duanshan. Um, Chosan was more or less used just as a stand-in for a generic Northeast Asian uh, uh, imperial rival. And I think what gives this sort of story credibility or um, resonance is that it's actually a, a long tr trope, um, something that we see uh, used over and over in late imperial Chinese uh, fiction and, and media, if you will. Um, and uh, one set of stories, uh, is uh, which has been studied actually uh, by um, uh, b before uh, is uh, the the story of Xue, Xue Renggui who campaigns east. So Xue Renggui is a seventh century, uh, eighth century, seventh to eighth century general who uh, is famous for his exploits against the kingdom of Koguryu. Um, but what is interesting is that if you go through different versions of the Xue Renggui story, uh, the identity of his enemy changes. Sometimes it's the Korean kingdom of Koguryo, sometimes it's just Koryo, and oftentimes it's uh, the Kitan Liao Empire. And, um, and other uh, versions of the story are, are similar stories uh, of the Tang War with Koguryo, for example, the Beijing opera Sanjiang Yue Chen. In this, the Koguryo general, uh, Ke Somun, is uh, identified as a Kitan um, general. 
Right. So, so I think we have this uh, understanding of, of of Korea as this um, really generic, I would say, uh, Northeast Asian rival to the empire. And um, <clears throat> And this is not just a question of their geographical continuity, uh, I mean, uh, overlap, but I also think that there is an understanding in Chinese history or understanding of uh, history in China that, that recognizes the Kitan Liao as, the con con as continuous with, uh, with Koguryo, which is not something that uh, is well known or is accepted in, in Korea, but I think remains in the popular imagination. So even though the idea of a Chosan invasion was uh, is maybe less implausible than might first appear, especially for a late imperial audience, um, I think that you know, what what we can point to is that these uh, elements of historical fiction actually bring in uh, certain real historical uh, knowledge, but they're recombined in in, in ways that uh, are still actually recognizable. So another uh, story that mo most likely circulated in some kind of popular form in the 15th century uh, is uh, the story of Pu Zhen, who is a uh, Ming general who uh, fought off a invasion by Korea. Um, and again, this is fictional. Um, and, and Pu Zhen refused to surrender to the king of Korea and uh, committed suicide. Right. And then the emperor recognized this emperor's loyalty. So this is this was definitely a, a popular story because this Anecdote um, enters in many 16th century uh, accounts, uh, even though we can't really be sure where it comes from. Um, the historical Hu Zhen did die in a war, but he was fighting not the uh, Koreans, but the Uriankai Mongols, also in Manchuria. So I think, uh, in short, this notion of Korea as a threat or rival to China re relies on conflating uh, all the neighbors of Northeast China into one big uh, group, right? So. And there are foundations, historical foundations, that make this uh, plausible. For example, the Suyan Tang invasions of Koguryo, the Tang Koguryo rivalry, um, and uh, and then the Ming Jurchen conflict, where uh, Northeast Asia is a potential sort of threat. In the 18th century, right when um, Chen Duanshen is writing, we're in the Qing Dynasty. Northeast Asia is uh, has already been uh, conquered, right? Uh, or is, is already part of the empire. There is no separate Manchurian uh, uh, power that could um, that could be a source uh, of danger, uh, but there is the Chosan state. So I think uh, Chen Duanzhen at in the 18th century is looking for uh, what is a plausible uh, you know stand-in for for the storyline. So let me talk about uh, Empire and Ecumen in the Water Margin continued, and um, so all the stories I'm, you know, talking about today are not the sort of A-list uh, 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 stories of uh, of Chinese imperial fiction. Um, I'd be surprised if any of you have heard of these stories uh, or let alone read them. I mean, they're they're not uh, the ones that that people turn to today. However, uh, the Water Margin is very famous. It's one of the four classic novels. But I'm not talking about the original Water Margin. I'm talking about the, the fourth or fifth um, sequel written uh, on the Water Margin. And uh, its author is uh, Chen Chen, uh, who was a Ming loyalist. Uh, so he refused to recognize the legitimacy of the Qing, the Manchu Qing dynasty. Um, and so this is his historical uh, fiction, um, uh, his addition to the Water Margin. So if you know the, the basic plot of the Water Margin is... Uh, it's a bunch of bandits who get together. They swear brotherhood with one another. There are 108 of them, and they fight injustice and corruption. But they are outlaws, and uh, and eventually they um, they surrender to the imperial court. So that's the original plot of the Water Margin. So in this version, um, after all the heroes of the original die, except for I think around 17 of them, they pick a new leader named Li Jun who uh, the Murky River Dragon, Huan Jianlong Li Jun. And uh, long story short, he eventually becomes the king of Siam. Uh, that is Thailand, well, where Thailand is now. And Siam is not the only place that makes a foreign, uh, makes a, a foreign place that makes an appearance in the story. The Korean kingdom of Koryo also appears. They even name uh, the king of Koryo, uh, uh, who they name Li Yu or Yi Wu in Korean. 
Um, and this name is clearly based on a real Korean king named Wang Wu, who was King Yejong of Koryo, uh, who lived in the 12th century. And uh, uh, but except in this story, they changed the surname to Li, uh, which is the uh, royal surname of the Chosun dynasty. And the story ends, uh, or in the last chapter of the story, uh, after Li Jun becomes the new king of Siam, his friend, uh, the king of Koryo, whom he meets on his adventures earlier, decides to join him. Right. And so, so the Li Yu shows up or Yu shows up and says to Li Jun, we are of the same surname. Our two countries are neighbors. We now join together as brothers to serve loyally the celestial court, the Song dynasty, to comfort and shepherd the myriad surnames. Whosoever should betray or violate these vows shall be ejected by heaven. So, I mean, if you've read the Shui Dran or the, the Water Margin, um, you know, essentially what has happened is uh, the king of Korea has joined the water margin heroes as one of them. Um, and uh, they they swear what we might call a mutual defense alliance. And the reason they do this uh, is that they earlier in the uh, in the story, they fight off an invasion uh, from the Japanese. Uh, the according to the the later margin, uh, the water margin continued. Uh, the greedy king of Korea, uh, I mean, the greedy king of Japan, wished to conquer Siam for himself and dispatched his official, the Kanbaku, to attack Li Jing and conquer Siam. As the novel explains, this Kanbaku was not a personal name, but an official title. And this is an unmistakable reference to the Imjin War of 1592-1597, uh, during which uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the de facto ruler of Japan, uh, took the title Kanbaku. And in the story, they also describe the Japanese in less than flattering terms. Uh, they say that uh, Japan was founded by the sorcerer Shu Fu, and his entourage was sent by the Qing emperor in search of the elixir of immortality. Though his its country loved poetry, calligraphy, antiquities, which are the hallmarks of the cosmopolitan imagination, right? They were, however, greedy, deceitful, and murderous. So despite having a common cultural heritage, they are, quote, by nature, cruel and unkind and insatiably greedy. So we can contrast this stereotype portrayal of Japan with, with how Korea is described. Um, in the story, it says, uh, Korea is where the sage ruler Kija established his kingdom, where the brilliance of civilization, rights and music had flourished since the Han and Tao, ministered by generations of great statesmen. So the plot points in in the in the uh, later water margin or the water margin continued um, again um, refract uh, documented real historical events, but uh, and um, incorporate them to sort of suit a particular Ming loyalist agenda. Um, so it's not very hard to read how the Jing is actually uh, representing a, a fantasy of a Ming loyalist who, uh, if you uh, who uh, by going and joining up with Korea. Um, are promising to try to restore the Song Dynasty, uh, which in in the mid 12th century is uh, is uh, at war with the Jurchens. So, um, and of course, the Jurchens are the ancestors of the Manchus who conquered the Ming. So, so this works really well as a as a direct allegory. Okay, so the last story I want to talk about is uh, which I think captures. The tension between empire and cosmopolis is uh, a scene from the heroes of the great Ming, the Daming Ying Lie Zhuan. So just a little bit about this novel. Um, it's a Yan Yi style novel. So Yan Yi style novels are these long romances about adventure, uh, usually. So Romance of the Three Kingdoms, uh, Water Margin Counts, uh, and uh, and also uh, you can say Journey to the West is also in that form. Uh, and there are many, many chapters. Um, this one is 80 chapters, I believe. Um, and uh, in chapter 72, uh, the Ming emperor, uh, who has defeated the Mongols in battle and assumes the imperial throne. And uh, he assembles all, his, all of his officials um, upon learning of his uh, military victory. But then we are told, uh, just as he's uh, coming to work, uh, a official reports that Koryo and other countries have dispatched the envoy Palimaha to present memorials of congratulations for the New Year's Day of the third year of the Homo reign. The Ming emperor read over the memorials and summoned Halimaha to inquire after the customs of his country. The envoy did not wish to delve into the details, but instead responded by reciting the following poem. So this is Halimaha, uh, the 
Korean envoy. Uh, our country is like a country of the Central Plains, as in our country is just like China. Our people are like those of antiquity. Uh, the clothes and caps follow Tang regulations. Ritual and music match those of the Han's rulers and officials. In vats of silver, we store new wine. With knives of gold, we slice brocade scales. Oops. Every year in the second and third months, the peach and plum bloom in the same spring. So according to the story, the Ming emperor heard this and said, that's so wonderful. Um, don't say that foreign lands do not produce men of talent. Just this one poem, we can sense that they are worry, worthy of being heard. And the emperor rewards the, uh, the, the envoy. So why does the emperor reward the envoy? Uh, well, one, the timing of the Korean embassy is important in the story. The Ming had just defeated the Mongols. The Korean ambassador could not have known about the Ming victory beforehand, but his arrival at the exact moment the emperor learns about it is a convenient coincidence. So it's like uh, it's an omen that signified all the pieces have fallen in place for the mandate of heaven to safely pass the Ming. So now the Ming can, can see itself as the new uh, emperors uh, of China. Uh, the poem uh, here reiterates some common tropes about Korea. One, uh, that uh, Korea is like China. They're part of the same civilization. It preserved ancient Han and Tang institutions. Um, and so in this way, the poem is quite, uh, uh, you know, reflects some of the tropes that we see in actual uh, diplomatic poetry at the time, right? But what is stark? is you know you have this assertion of being similar to china and then you have this name and uh, if you read chinese you'll see that uh, there's the square next to all the characters and what this usually signifies in in late imperial chinese writing is that this is uh we're using the characters only as pronunciation for words we don't understand so basically halimaha's name is foreign gibberish koreans um at this period would have used names that were legible to a Chinese audience uh, with a surname and usually two characters following the name and the names would be recognizably meaningful. So we have this Korean envoy claiming cultural parody with Ming, but he's represented as a unknowable uh, foreign barbarian without a real identity. So what does this mean that the barbarian speaking Chinese and claiming equality and cultural parody with Ming? So if we close read the poem, if we take this fact and look at the poem again, we see that there are a bunch of tensions embedded in the poem, even though it feels like it's very stereotyped and, uh, and there's not much to analyze. One is that it does claim parity with China, but by saying that they're the people, we're like the people of antiquity, it's also implying that they predate the Ming, that, that Koreans have access to a past, a classical past that is older and older, of course, means more authoritative than uh, the Chinese do. So is that competing? Is that a competition? Uh, second thing is that even though they're saying that they're equals, uh, there's also a claim of cultural difference, right? Um, I, I haven't figured out what the significance of silver in new wine might mean, but the, the golden uh, knife uh, sliding brogade scales is a reference to eating raw fish, uh, hue or maybe sashimi. Uh, so it's a cultural difference that's being asserted that, yes, we are exactly like you uh, culturally. In fact, we might even have more civilizational clout or uh, authority or legitimacy than you, but we're culturally different nonetheless. But the last line is a restatement of this imperial universalism or the, the idea that, you know, actually we're all part of the same world uh, where every year in the second and third months uh, our trees bloom under the same spring. So this is assertion of difference, similarity, uh, uh, all the tensions of what I've been describing as, the, as the, the shape of the cosmopolis are coming forward in this poem, and especially when we contrast this with the claims of the poem with how the uh, writer of the poem is marked in the story. All this becomes even more intriguing when we see that this is not the only place uh, the heroes of the great Ming, it's not the only place where this story appears. Uh, there's a historical chronicle from the 16th century that represents the same story, but we have a very different uh, uh, um, reaction from the emperor. So in the first one, in, one, in version one, which we just read, uh, Halimaha is Korean. Uh, it should typo here, I should say, is Korean. 
the emperor rewards the envoy and then he says you know uh do not say that foreign lands do not produce men of talent just this one poem we can sense that they are worthy of being heard so the emperor approves of the message in the second version halimaha is japanese the emperor re hears the poem and then says from this poem we can tell that Distance from us makes the Japanese caitiffs barbarians arrogant. It is therefore clear that we cannot treat them with the rights accorded to various vessels such as Korea. Even if we allow them to communicate with us in tribute, we must watch them carefully to prevent any incident. And the emperor punishes the envoy for arrogance. Okay, so the same poem elicits polar opposite reactions from the Ming court in these two different accounts. When Koreans declare cultural parity and shared political heritage, it earns the Ming emperor's respect. But the same statements, when they are spoken by a Japanese envoy, are taken as evidence of les majesty. The two divergent re renderings of basically the same probably fictional imagined incident suggest the existence of common but unstable original source which predates both works. Assertions of cultural parity that is commonality sought through a cosmopolitan vision, therefore, is not inherently compatible with the empire or the, its imperial pretenses. The very elements that make mutual identification possible, cultural identification possible, also embed the seeds of rivalry and suspicion. Okay, so I think we have to um, wrap up a bit. Um, I've been speaking for quite a long time. So what do the narratives represented in this vernacular register tell us? What sort of Korea does it represent? Certainly some of the details and plots were visibly inspired by real world historical events, but it makes little sense to see them as representing a real Korea. For one, it is doubtful that we they were even intended to be received as such. Um, I think people who read this probably were aware that this is fiction. It is not just, uh, but it is not just Korea that eludes us, but also I think what they show is that there isn't really a stable, self-coherent understanding of how imperial China relates to the world beyond its borders, or even where these borders properly lie. That's not to say that all of these things, um, you know, are just random. There, there is a logic through them, um, and I think the logic we can see through the repertoire of lot of tropes and images used in in these stories. Uh, so for heuristic purposes, I've been uh, using terms such as notion, uh, the notions of empire, ecumen, and cosmopolis. And I think they help us uh, think through the structure of these stories and the broader structure of knowledge they represent. Um, yes, uh, it's through the elaboration of stereotypes and tropes. But I think what are interesting is also the resonances between these vernacular registers. Um, so not just in the vernacular language, but but this vernacular space and also how they interact with uh, things that we might say are part of the, the elite cosmopolitan uh, level uh, of diplomatic epistles and official communications. Um, so, so I will leave off with just uh, this point that vernacular knowledge uh, was dialectically both the product and contributed to these uh, uh, perceptions of how Korea appears in imperial fiction. And, um, and even imperial officials, I think, likely interface with Korea through the filters created by the impressions they already possessed, mediated by the very same stereotyped Im images that inform these fictional vernacular works. So I think these, um, these interactions um, make explicit how our own categories stand in relation to those of the historical subjects we examine and shows how uh, they interweave conflict and produce tensions with one another. So all of these terms um, that you've, uh, that if you pick up a book about East Asia, um, you'll probably see something like, well, this is how East Asia works. Tributary system, Chinese world order, civilization, barbarian dichotomy, Sinosphere, Sinosphere, Cosmopolis. Um, I'm not saying these things are not valid descriptions, but I think what we need to do is think about how they interact with one another. And one of the places where we can think about how they interact with one another is through the vernacular register. It's a place where we see these things uh, which are normally uh, put out there as something coherent and totalizing. We see them break down and uh, interface with one another in maybe unexpected ways. So that's what I mean by the shape of the cosmopolis. And, and for those of you who are interested, uh, I do have a forthcoming book that is not quite about the issues discussed today. It's more about Korean diplomacy and the use of rhetoric and ritual in, um, 
in its interactions with Main China. Um, it's coming out end of this month or beginning of uh, June, uh, but you can already pre-order if you're interested. Uh, the link is on the QR code, and uh, and you know also Google works. Um, so I think I'll just stop here. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, taking the time to to listen. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> quite um, quite an interesting and also, you know, for some conclusions, unexpected conclusions, and quite um, um, uh, so. Not interesting is just you know too plain to to say. Um, I, I have a question for you, but you know, before let me mm -hmm. tell you, thank you, because um, you, Professor Wang, have um, opened our minds uh, and, and the students' minds, of, no, even more so, to um, many potential paths for research and for you know other uh, so directions for for studying, you know, in the future. What um, okay? I don't. I don't have the slide in front of me, but you know, the last one, the one where you, you know, uh, pointed out uh, sorry, the, the, the Tianxia uh, theory and the uh, Ming Tian theory, mm -hmm. and you know the, the and the last point is the, yeah exactly this one, and uh, you know so like the sinosphere and all these concepts. The, all these concepts are created. Um, made me think like, um, you know, the histories, the official histories written by the government for the government and for mm -hmm. members of the government. Yeah. So all these theories are done um, based on this kind of um, the, you know, one-sided direction of the um, elite towards, not downwards, Whereas the vernacular register gives way to other voices, to other ideas, to other ways of perception. And uh, exactly, you know, as you say, um, they give us the other side of the story. Um, then, so the, this other side of the story, the, you know, like the, the a, a side and B side, um, the B side could also not be based exactly on uh, exact ideas, but just on perceptions, because maybe they don't know history, because, you know, they don't know exactly how things are being dealt with. Uh, you know, with the, you know, we, within the, the the empire or within the country. But again, um, it's a kind of cultural. So it's this is the cultural studies of of the previous <laughs> of, of the pre previous generations. You know, so other right. voices coming up, you know, and and giving giving way to other opinions. So it's really opening up. Um, of of all kinds of possibilities. So really, thank you so much for this. Uh, I was really, um, uh, you know, pleasantly um, and intellectually also very, you know, very um, stimulated by you know this uh, this uh, um, uh, way of looking at things and and so and so. This is why also, I mean. I am the generation of um, so Korean studies, or I also was a little. I started also with Chinese studies because I studied both Chinese and Korean. Uh, so I studied with Tianxia, with Mo Ming Tian, with you know, so so Tian Ming and all all these kind of you know uh, things. So the the elite, uh, the imperial view of you know of the of the uh, of East Asia. But uh, I see that also in terms of research, um, there is, so another way is starting, another way, you know, other voices and other ways uh, of looking from, even from the outside to this, uh, towards these things. So uh, your talk is, um, 
really under many aspects. It, it, it was very, it has been, you know, very, very uh, interesting and eye-opening. Eye um, I would like to ask the students to, you know, to ask questions. Even though uh, you have spoken about a kind of literature that we very rarely touch because, you know, especially, you know, Chinese histories and, and Chinese vernacular stories are not what we study. And here, basically, you have studies, students who study major in Korean. And so they study everything about Korea. So this is also new for them. But um, um, it's quite, quite interesting, you know, the, the um, approach, the methodological approach, the research approach. So maybe under this kind of um, aspects, uh, our student could, could have uh, several questions, I think. So I just leave them, you know, the floor and, and please, um, please ask. <laughs> Are there any questions? Ragazzi, ragazzi, avete domande? Curiosità, spiegazioni, punti che non avete capito bene. Ci siete? Michela, puoi, puoi contattarli eventualmente? Ci sono? Ma esserci spero ci siano. <ride> Adesso magari non so, uh, può provare a chiedere a qualcuno che le ha scritto? Iris, se magari... Iris qui ha scritto, ha scritto anche Alberton, Monica ha detto che è tutto chiaro. Mm. Um, I would like, um, actually, uh, while you were, you were, you know, you, you were uh, presenting your, your um, uh, lecture, I was thinking of the times when uh, Korea uh, speaks about itself as so uh, 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 like a small China um, during you know, the Qing, Qing times when, when Korea doesn't really seem to acknowledge the authority of the new foreign uh, the, the dynastic power. What do you think of this? Hmm. Um, there are many things to say, right? I mean, this is a so you're thinking so uh, in per, in particular vis-a-vis -vis the idea of being the real heirs of Chinese civilization. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, well, I think it's it's you know, if we think about this, right? I mean, that's a great example of where the cosmopolis breaks down. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a view that you don't see if you uh, think about it from Chinese sources or Chinese perspectives. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it, you do get a bit of that in, you know, the contestation over whether the Manchus should really be um, uh, heirs to the to the Ming Empire. So there is that debate in China. It's just squashed very quickly uh, by the by the state. Yeah, uh, by, the Qing, it, no? by the Qing, right. no, by the Qing. But outside, right. it happens yeah. even worse. Right. You right. Know, it's uh, even well, in, yeah, I mean, and, and we see this all over East Asia, right? There's there's a bit of this in Vietnam, there's a bit of this in, in Korea and Japan in terms of saying that the Qing are illegitimate. Um, but, you know, what I think is actually uh, the Qing conquest of Ming um, provide a sort of uh, framework where uh, chosen Koreans can break out of this, uh, this pr one particular trap, the ecumenical trap, uh, where they no longer have to worry about being barbarians, right? Uh, I think in the Ming period, Chosan, the standard line is, you know, we Chosan are barbarians who have become civilized. Um, and this is thanks to our closeness to China. 
uh, once you're in the 17th and 18th century, uh, it's no longer necessary to say that, right? I mean, that's no longer a valid way of expressing yourself. Of course, you know, on the diplomatic scale, uh, uh, um, scale of interaction, um, they're not doing this. But internally, I think uh, the the burden of being e or not um, uh, uh, the the idea of being barbarian is it doesn't provide isn't as much of a problem, I think, intellectually. Uh, so I think that is one opening that uh, that that comes out. And I think you you do have in other um, kinds of texts, for example, uh, a stronger assertion of Korea's uh, distinctness uh, in the ecumenical world, right? Um, so, so if you look at this first slide, right, I, I think um, you know we we don't know when this map was drawn, but this is uh, 18th century, maybe even 19th century, where there is this imagined China here, um, and then this is India uh, with the Buddhist world, um, and then you have the kingdom of Chosan in in red. Um, and I think it's, uh, you know, this is a very clear expression of the, the Sojongha um, uh, idea. Um, and, but I think it's, um, I guess, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot to say. Um, but I, uh, I guess uh, if, if you had some particular uh, angle or, or, or issue that you had in mind, uh, I can speak more about it. But at the moment, I think I can go in any direction. <laughs> yeah, well, um, actually, uh, when you say, uh, I mean, I've studied basically only Korea afterwards, you know, I've started with China, China and Korea, and then I've continued, I've, I, and I've, you know, I, I went on only with, uh, with Korea. But all I've read about, even in literature, in poetry, in, you know, in this, in over these years, maybe uh, I've missed very important books. <laughs> One could also argue this, but all, all I've read up to now has really basically given me the idea um, that Korea, okay, for Chinese eyes, Korea could be a barbarian. No, a barbaric country. Mm. But for Korea, they have never thought of themselves as the barbarians. They have created other barbarians and they have joined hands with China against the barbarians. This is the idea that I caught from yeah. you know reading oh. all kinds of literature, music, uh, not much philosophy because it's not my field, of course, but you know, even within literature, I've I've had this kind of um, so this was really enlightening. <laughs> and and if you think also, you know, about it, it's also yeah, okay, it's normal because you know the the uh, all visions are uh, so the sinocentric vision of of the world wants China to think that all the rest of the world is barbaric. Mm -hmm. But yeah. for all these other countries, it's like, it makes me think of the Roman Empire. You know, so, so for, for, in order to be part of the Roman Empire, you had to be citizen of Rome. Uh, it, it wasn't enough that you were learning Latin or whatever, you had to be citizen of Rome. And so, um, for Korea, being citizen of Rome means to uh, not only learn the language, not only being able to write in that language, which anyway, it's not the spoken language, but you know, we know all that. But probably, um, uh, but also not probably, but also to um, absorb the administrative uh, structure, the literary, you know, uh, poem, poetry, poetry, is, poetry in Chinese is, uh, is a huge, huge thing in Korea, yeah. you know, the fortune and especially of tongue poetry, tongue and song poetry in Korea is, you know, is, is the best and it goes on and it creates models and, and patterns of, of poetry writing styles. So, uh, Korea becomes really, you know, not only because it feels itself as 
uh, not barbarian. Yeah. In I, comparison I guess... with Japanese, for example, you know, because also in the in the official histories, never Japan is dealt with as a non-barbarian country. Right. So never. I think it's I think one way to think about this, right, is Korean expression, right? I think, uh, I mean, we'd have to generalize. There's always an exception, right? But mm. yes, they assert themselves as civilized all the time. Mm. Um, and it's very important to do so. But I think there's also a very clear anxiety that they would be perceived otherwise. Yes, So, definitely. So we see... Yeah, so so in the diplomatic uh, records, uh, you know, it, it's it's almost like uh, every time uh, a Chinese official uses the word barbarian to talk about Korean, the Japan <laughs> the, the Korean envoy will protest and says, "You cannot say that about us," and then goes into this whole speech about why that's not true. But but I think the reality is uh, the Korea's uh, place is un unstable in the Chinese imperial imagination, mm -hmm. and I think Koreans know this, and I think this is a source of anxiety. So they, I don't think, I think they firmly believe that they are not barbarian. And if they were, it was uh, 2000 years ago, right? Um, but but I think the anxiety um, and, and also the frustration that, that this acceptance doesn't come in um, is, is a driving point of why they're uh, asserting this over and over again. And, and you see this in, you know, in the 18th century uh, with the with the uh, the book collectors, people like Yi Dongmu, Yi Yik and, and whatnot, they read Chinese histories and one of their favorite topics is uh, when they feel like uh, the Chinese um, scholar is misrepresenting Korea, right? Uh, or, or Korea is being being portrayed as more barbarian uh, than they actually is, or if they misunderstand something about Korean history, and then they they lament mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. even though we are civilized, um, people in China still see us this way. How sad, right? So I think it's, uh, and I think this is what I mean, right? The, the, the sort of the shape of the cosmopolis. It's something that um, it looks different uh, from different angles, right? And I think right, um, right, yeah, yeah. So and, this and, is yeah, this is quite, sorry, sorry, I didn't, didn't want ahead. to interrupt. Go you. ahead, no, no, Please. no, 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 you go ahead. Did you finish oh, oh, or? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so, yeah. sorry. So no, but this is and and here we we could also really go into the use of words, no, the terminology, which is used. Uh, Inside or outside the cosmopolis, uh, mm -hmm. and all you know, all, all values that you know, different values that uh, are given to the terms from both outside or inside of the cosmo cosmopolis. And again, what is this co cosmopolis? You know, what is it really? Uh, so um, I was born uh, into you know into the the you know the old school <laughs> then uh, and i've lived through this cosmopolis idea uh, i might have you know i might be lucky uh, to uh, enter into you know at, at, or at least to get some glimpses of what is the next uh, paradigm beyond the cosmopolis uh, <sighs> you know <laughs> in terms of research approaches <laughs> but um, you know really very yeah. very uh, interesting um i don't know if um there are not uh, qu no questions uh, maybe we could even you know uh, finish earlier than uh, than the usual time uh, sorry could i ask a quick question I didn't want to interrupt you and I wanted to give you all the space you <laughs> deserve to discuss. Uh, I think Professor Durso is okay with that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I was wondering about the last source you mentioned, the Heroes of Great Ming. And you talked about two versions. In the first, the envoy is Korean and in the mm -hmm. second, he is Japanese. And yeah. How do we know that? Like, is it there a difference in the word used or is it assumed from the context or is it just an hypothesis? Uh, it's it's what uh, it's literally says envoy from Koryo, envoy from Ilbon, from Japan. Right. So so it's uh, it's marked that way. But the um, name is the same, right? The name is the same. And the name oh. is gibberish in both languages. Right. This oh, is uh, 
Halimaha is it's not plausibly Japanese, nor is it plausibly Korean. I see. Thank um, you. <laughs> yeah. So um I mean yeah, I think it's a you know it, it's it's a strange thing where it's a generic foreigner, uh, but also not very generic at the same time. So it's it's uh, it's it's everything smushed together in, into one um, figure. Yeah, and then um, yeah, I I haven't been able to trace it trace the anecdote to anything before the 15th century, uh, the late 15th century. So, but I think there is. Uh, there are these, uh, you know, and, and the 15th century, early 15th century um, and late 14th century is kind of a black hole uh, for Chinese uh, popular culture. Uh, we don't have very much that survives from that period. Um, a lot, I think, was lost in the destruction of the main libraries um, and the and the encyclopedias that would have had this kind of stuff. And print culture wasn't which just wasn't as uh, robust then. And then you also, it's also a lull in theater culture. So I think it's just what, what we don't, we just don't know much about the early 15th century, what people are thinking um, relative to the explosion of, um, of print and things like that later. Anyway, just some more context. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, um... Any other observations or questions, doubts, comments? Well, maybe I have a question uh, about the audience. Um, so you said they, everybody uh, is studying uh, Korean? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah, they're all students of um, Korean uh, uh, language, cultures, and societies. <laughs> So within the Asia and African languages, cultures, and societies, they specialize in Korean language. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, you know, they do Korean studies. But the main focus, uh, at least at the, at the yeah. you know, BA level is, of course, learning the language, language right. and the culture, you know, the surrounding history and art and uh, literature. Yeah. I mean, but, one thing um, I... Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I can add. No, 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 maybe. no. Go just, ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, is um, is just uh, you know, if we think about these issues uh, from a more contemporary perspective, is mm -hmm. um, I'm I, I'm sure some of you follow social media, and every so often, a Korean, you know, there's a new Korean drama, and then there's uh, and it's historical drama, and there's they're in Hanbok, and then China, somebody in China gets angry and says, "This is not Hanbok. This is Ming clothing." And then <laughs> Korean, uh, you know, I, I think some of you are familiar, probably know about this, right? This kind of uh, back and forth and everybody's yeah. yelling at each other. And I think, <laughs> you know, from, uh, and I think what's interesting is if you are able to read between the lines and see this, is that some of the same dynamic exists mm -hmm. uh, today, right? Um, because in both Korea and China, is that the netizens are the people online who are on Twitter and or whatever, fighting yeah. with one another. Yeah. Uh, they are the operating, citizens of the net. Right, the uh, you know, which was supposed to be yeah. cosmopolitan. But what mm -hmm. is actually happening is that these uh, everybody knows they are fighting against their imagination of the other, right? So the Korean netizen is fighting against their imagination of what a Chinese nationalist stereotype yeah. of Korea is. And the yeah. Chinese nationalists are fighting against their imagination of Korea. So, you know, in China, there is uh, all these uh, things that people just assume are true, right? That, uh, that all Koreans believe that Confucius is Korean, or that uh, they all believe that Koreans uh, believe that they invented this or that, right? And you mm -hmm. go to Korea, um, and Koreans mostly don't believe this, uh, sure. or don't care, or don't know about this, and or have no <laughs> stake. And then there's a small minority of maybe internet trolls who who pump this up or pseudo historians. And the flip side is also true in China. Most Chinese yeah. people do not care about uh, whether or not the clothing is Korean or not, right? But but the but the but what we find in the sort of vernacular space, mm -hmm. the vernacular cosmopolitan space of Twitter and uh, Facebook or whatever. Oh, I guess in China they don't use it as much. It, it, but 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 what they produce, reproduce, are actually are these narratives about culture, where culture comes from. Um, that are some of which you can actually trace to to this late uh, 15th century, 16th century. Um, uh, late, late, habits. Uh, yeah, habits, but also habits. Some, of, yeah. some of the actual ideas 
you can trace due to these, um, to as some if, of these, uh, yeah. The, yeah, the, as if, mm -hmm. the, right, as, as if, you know, people never change. <laughs> but, people's minds, the functioning yeah. of people's right. minds never change. You may but, have, which, there are cycles, cycles yeah. that repeat themselves or, or I, I don't know, some, some kind of frames, some, some frames of minds that, that, that stay or some kind of ideas that don't get changed with, you know, with the passing of centuries. But basically, it's not even about the ideas. I think it's about, really about mm -hmm. um, the, the, the way a uh, human mind works <laughs> yeah. sometimes. So it, it, absolutely. Um, I think the structural element is there, but I, I think, you know, because we do East Asia, um, but I do think, um, you know, the ideas, I mean, the, there is a continuity, maybe not in the ideas, but in the means or in the content of some of the, uh, of what's going on. Right. Um, I, I think, uh, let me give a concrete example. Uh, uh, the one about Chosan invading, um, uh, the Mongol empire or invading <laughs> Yuan China, right? Which, which you know, to, it, it just is so absurd. It, it, it's silly <laughs> to imagine, you know, from any angle, right? But but this is what the text says, right? This is, yeah. it's very clear that Huang Fu Shaohua is fighting Chuzhan or Chaoxian. Uh, they made Zai Shenyuan into a uh, historical drama, like a, a romantic uh, drama, I, I think 2010. You mean in China? In yeah, China, yeah. I mean, they it, this. Yeah, okay. yeah. They, they, they made it, um, but in it, the, the enemy is now Chuzhan. Mm. They 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 don't put Korea as the enemy, right? Mm. Uh, why not? Well, because it's absurd, right? In the to the modern <laughs> audience, uh, the, a Chinese, uh, a proud Chinese nationalist audience will not say to the mm. idea that Korea would be a threat to China. It would just be so absurd in that imagination. So they write it out. So it so in a sense, like these little choices actually matter, right? If it were just fiction and it doesn't matter, you can keep the original text, but they have to change it. Right, because there's something, um, and I think this is why um, Koryo becomes the Kitans or the Liao um, uh -huh. in Beijing Opera. Uh, Ke is no longer Koryo, but becomes Kitan. Because I think, you know, if you're in, if it's 1920 and you're making a Beijing Opera, I mean, I have no evidence for this, but but the speculation is if the person shows up and says, "I'm from Korea, I'm fighting the Tang," it, it it it's jarring. So so regard so even though historically the character would have been from Koryo. They would have uh, they they slip it in. So these slippages, I think, are are actually they're connected to um, these sort of concerns about identity and 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 whatnot. Exactly. That, are, that yeah. um, so so it's it's continuous, right? There, it's still part of the conversation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, you know, other there, there. I can go on and on about the sort of modern iteration of this. You know, mm -hmm. I think many of your students probably know Chunyangjian, right? Um, or have watched or the, the movie yeah or, well yeah, difficult do, difficult to escape right. <laughs> from Chunyang right, John because in the movie you, you have movies you have theater you have you know uh pansori you have you yeah. know whatever you know uh, you so, also have Chinese opera of Chunyang John oh. uh, yeah and it's it's but actually but one because of because it yeah it was probably a you know a, like a model or some kind of uh um, uh, I don't know, um, a literary a literary trope, you know, as you were saying, something that maybe may be changing the name, but it, it stays the same. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the, the where, it, how it got to China is 1951 Korean War, North Koreans oh, were born, okay. right? And then, and oh. then Chinese um, opera singers who were in the Korean War brought the Chunyanjan into China and now it's a, so I'll just give you a, a I mean, I'm not gonna show you the, the, uh, but, but this is- That Chinese was North Korean. Korean. Right, this but this Chinese. is 19, this is 1983 Yueju, Shanghainese, uh, uh, it's not Shanghai, it's uh, Zhejiang Opera, right? And and uh -huh. it, it's the plot of Chinanjan, but it's, uh, but huh. when they, but they have to readapt this play um, into, uh, Incredible. you know, for, for, a, for a Chinese context. So a lot of the social dynamics, right, the things that are not legible to the cosmopolis about Chunyanjan, for example, the slavery system, everything that's culturally specific about Korea, except for the clothing or, you know, the hanbok style uh, mm -hmm. is cut out. And then it just becomes a, a classic Chinese story of, um, 
of uh, of uh, the Taiza Jaren, the 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 romance. Uh, but the things that are left out of the opera, right, are things that are specific to Korea's social history. For example, mm -hmm. Pangja, right, who's the slave, is replaced. Mm -hmm. uh, he they they that character can't work in the Chinese context because he's illegible. It doesn't make sense. So they turn him into um, the uh, the Yi Meng uh assistant, uh, a boy servant rather than oh, okay. Slave. Right, okay. the, 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 these subtle changes, right? Um, and I think, uh, you know, uh, yeah. So if I were to extend this question of the cosmopolis, shape of the cosmopolis, um, you know, these would be the kinds of things I would look at. And and the other, and you know, if we go back to the whole fight about Chinese clothing or hanbok versus Chinese clothing, is that the irony is that well, hanbok and Ming clothing look similar because Chosun Koreans were interested in participating in the cosmopolis and Ming wanted Korea to be participating in the cosmopolis. Exactly. But now in the 21st century, this similarity becomes a huge problem for nationalists <laughs> on both sides. And they have yes. to decide, um, you know, which one is it? Um, they can't share. And so, so this is a, <laughs> whereas in the, in, in the 15th century, right? The, the whole point of it was that you want to be you want to share certain important elements of culture. That's what it means to be, we have the same antiquity. We follow the models of the Han and Ta. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, no, no. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, the position is totally um, um, upside down now, you know, the, the, the consideration. And, um, and then again, you know, going back to your talk, um, to your lecture, uh, I think another um, aspect which should interest the students is that, um, and and we as well, you know, also also us as as, as teachers, is that um, you can never just take what you learn on Korea from Korea for granted. Um, not because they lie, of course, not because of that, but because exactly within this cosmopolitan cosmopolis uh, idea as well as on other subjects um it it makes no sense to speak about korean literature korean history korea is part of east asia east asia is part of you know something bigger uh, and there are so many interactions so even you know this idea of the cosmopolis should not be seen from China outside or just from Korea outside, but um, you know it and, and it confirms um, also the, the 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 position. My what I'm trying to to um, uh, reach and to find out and to invite also my students to do through this lecture is. It, this, this you know cycle of lectures is really to open their minds um, and consider one aspect a, a, a according to many sides on from many sides and and see how um, uh, what we today we say or we think it's not necessarily true or not necessarily complete. And in order to um, reach a, a broader comprehension of them of one matter of one uh, subject, then you do necessarily have to go through other people's eyes, other countries' ideas, uh, and therefore do not limit yourself to Korea, but go beyond Korea, you know, and embrace also other countries and other views other lenses to see the world in the area that we're working in and uh, and then again this brings back to the concept of chinese studies korean studies <laughs> what is exactly korean studies what is exactly chinese studies does it make sense to speak about chinese studies or should we just really go into Asian studies, East Asian studies. So this this is also, you know, food for thought for ourselves, for what we envision as our um, uh, duty or, or our um, um, task. 
within the university, within, within the research world, you know. So it, it, you know, it brings about so many thoughts. It was so, you know, I really appreciated it. Um, thank you really so much <laughs> for, for this quite, uh, quite uh, um, no, uh, uh, interesting talk. More than the details, okay, within you know a story you look at the details but then the broader picture more than the details is the approach that helps us understand that uh, cooperation is so precious and so necessary you know to to try to get um a, a, a better picture if you know if this is ever possible <laughs> <laughs> Well, th anyway. thank you so much for no. uh, for being a captive audience in both senses of the word. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Anyway, uh, so uh, what, uh, what what shall we do, um, Alice? I think we can uh, we can stop here with the lecture if yes. if there are no more no more questions uh, from the students. Okay. Mm, what do you say? Uh, I will have to talk uh, with uh, Professor Wang for a little while. Shall we stay on uh, on this Zoom? I, link sorry, or... I, I stopped the recording. Just one second. Ah, yes, yes. Sorry, this was.